Hallelujah. We're going to continue our study this morning in the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, I don't know what I was thinking, but I could get through a chapter a week. Yeah. And, you know, there's just no way that's going to happen. So but we'll cover a lot of different subjects. As a matter of fact, today you'll see we'll, we'll go somewhere you never dreamed we'd be going. And somewhere really we don't go too often here at Crossroad Fellowship. Maybe not often enough. But we'll be talking about the last days a little bit today. But first of all, I'm going to start off by telling you what we're going to talk about for the next two or three weeks, and that is Peter's first sermon. Okay? And when I started thinking about his first sermon, if you've ever uh, uh, spoken to a group of people or performed in some way in front of a group of people, you can know how nerve-wracking that can be. Amen? Anybody ever been there? You stand up in front of people and, and, and have to talk and you just get so nervous. Well, it reminded me of my first sermon. And uh, I preached it. It's been probably over 30 years ago. And uh, I, I can remember it like it was uh, yesterday. I preached at a uh, senior citizen's home. There was a lady in the church I attended, Calvary Baptist Church. Her name was Margaret Tucker. And she was over all these senior citizen's homes. It was like McCurdy. Schnoody, uh, 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 Rathbone, and there were several others. And, and uh, anyway, she would line up different speakers, and you know, I was up and ready to go preacher, sort of. And uh, so anyway, she asked me to speak. And uh, so I, 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 I mean, I prepared for this sermon. Cheryl was there, and uh, this is when we were just uh, friends, uh, back when we were friends, now we're married. <laughs> But, um, you know, there was 20 or 30 elderly people sitting out there, and, and I was supposed to speak for 15 minutes. And I remember Cheryl and I sit over at Alden Park on the picnic <coughs> table. And, I mean, I was preparing, timing it. You know, I mean, I had this thing down. 15 minutes. I was going through the Christian walk out of Ephesians, how you know, walk worthy, circumspectly, and, and had all these different ways that we walk. And, and I was just ready for this sermon. Got it down 15 minutes. So the day came and I stood up and I looked out over all those uh, elderly faces and, and uh, you know, and woke a few of them up and then I began. And uh, seven minutes later, I was done. Five minutes. Five minutes later, I was done and sat down. I spent less than half of the time preaching because I felt I was so nervous. And, uh, you know, but everybody was so kind to me. Oh, you did such a great job. I so enjoyed that. Even Cheryl said, great job. But it took her 20 years to finally tell me that it was pretty bad. <laughs> and uh, she, she's my best critic now. You know, she, you know, she'll, she don't say it's bad, but you know, she doesn't say anything. Then I know, well, it probably wasn't out of the ballpark this morning. But, but anyway, uh, this morning, I'm going to look at a Peter's first sermon. Which in no way was like your pastor's first sermon. It was totally different. Uh, we'll see that he was not nervous. But he got up and he spoke in boldness. And he spoke in the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he wasn't preaching to 20 or 30 people. He was preaching to thousands and thousands of people. As we have been talking about. They were all gathered there for uh, the feast. And, and there was you know, thousands of, uh, of people there. And we see a huge response to his message. We see that there were 3,000 people that accepted Christ that day, that responded to his message. Now, last Sunday, we talked about the 120 folks that were in the upper room. Uh, they were gathered there together as Jesus had instructed them. We saw that the Holy Spirit filled each one of them. Uh, we saw that there was a powerful sound, and we talked about that quite a bit last week. It was a sound like maybe a hurricane or a tornado. The sound of a mighty rushing wind came and it rested in the room. I mean, can you imagine that today? I mean, I've had some experiences uh, with the Holy Spirit and I've seen some powerful things. I, I've seen uh, the atmosphere in a room change suddenly and, and seen the power and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But I imagine none of that was anything like what they experienced there that day when the Holy Spirit first arrived and it came and it rested in the room. 
We, we saw not only was there was this great sound, but there was tongues of fire that set on each one of them. I don't even, can't even begin to imagine what that was like. Then we see that they began to speak in unknown tongues, but it could be understood by all the different nationalities that were represented there that day. Naturally, this grew a large crowd for Peter to preach to. Then we see this awesome message delivered by the Apostle Peter. We see a huge difference in the guy that he was. It wasn't too long before that that he, adult, he denied Christ three times. Then it says he cursed. Dag, now I don't know him. Well, that may not be the exact words that he used, but you know, we're keeping family friendly today. Amen? So uh, anyway, uh, he said, I don't know him. Before we see Peter as impetuous, Peter was the first guy to jump in. Amen? You know, when he was in that boat, he saw Jesus coming. What did he do? Oh, bid me to come to you. I'm going to walk on this water like you're walking on this water. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. When they came to get Jesus, he was the first one to grab his sword, and he just got a guy's ear. Amen? Now we see him being the one that stands up to address this huge crowd. He's ready to proclaim the gospel. And listen, Peter did not pull any punches. He told it like it was. You know, we don't have enough of that today. I mean, I don't believe we ought to condemn people, but we need to, as believers, stand up for the truth. Amen? We don't need to back down. We don't need to compromise. The truth is the truth. The Word of God is the Word of God. And we do not need to back down on that. I don't care how unpolitically correct we might be. We need to stand up and say, thus saith the Word of God. But in Acts 2.36, you'll see what he's talking about uh, uh, when I say he did not pull any punches. Listen, in Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God made this Jesus, listen, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now he didn't say that out of revenge. It wasn't because he was mad at the people. You crucified my Lord. Oh, he didn't say it out of revenge, but rather in love. If he wanted revenge, he'd just keep his mouth shut, amen? Let him die in your sin and go to hell. But no, he loved the people even though they had crucified Christ. Well, I have news for you. We all crucified Christ, amen? Everybody in that crowd did not crucify Christ because some of them got in after that happened. But yet he said, you crucified Christ. Each one of us had done it because of our sin, amen? And he had to die, or he chose to die for our sin. So he goes on. Uh, he said, you need a Savior. You see, we have to know that we are sinners before we know we need a Savior. Amen? Verse 14, listen to what he says. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. So we see here that Peter stands up and he looks out over the crowd and he begins to speak to the crowd that is gathered there because of the events that have just taken place. And we see although Peter uh, uh, is the one doing the talk and he said he stood up with the 11 others. They all stood up with him. I think that's good, amen? I know there's been times in my life I stood up thinking people were behind me and I turned around and I'm the only one standing there, amen? Sometimes, you know, it's good to have people standing with you. And it says they, they stood up with the eleven. Now you have to remember, again, this is not exactly a friendly crowd. Just days before, the crowd was chanting, Crucify Him! You remember the story where uh, uh, Pilate addressed the crowd and he said, uh, you know, I, I believe it was a, a, an annual ritual where they would allow one prisoner to go free. And uh, he had Jesus there, and they had a guy named Barabbas. Everybody remember that story? And uh, 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 Barabbas was a mean man. I mean, he, he was a murderer, a liar, a thief, and everything else that you can imagine. And uh, so Pilate thought maybe this is a way that he could calm all this down and let Jesus go. And he said, uh, who do you want me to, to, to let loose today? Barabbas or this man Jesus? And everybody yelled, Barabbas! We want Barabbas! He was kind of shocked by that. Well, what shall I do with this man Jesus? And you know what they said? Crucify him! 
Crucify Him. All of them begin to chant, Crucify Him, Crucify Him. This is the same crowd that Peter was standing up to address that day. I mean, for all he knew, they could begin to chant, Crucify Peter! How dare you say we did whatever you said we did. Amen? So he goes on. In a loud voice. He's now filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with boldness to proclaim the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. Peter, in a loud voice, began to speak up over the crowd for all to hear. He says, okay, folks, listen up. He says, we're not drunk. I like that word, as you suppose. <laughs> we're not drunk, as you suppose. You know, they may have been drunk on the new wine. Amen. They may have been a little drunk by the power of the Holy Spirit that's been in their, their hearts and their lives at this point. But he goes, we're not drunk, as you suppose. No one gets drunk this early, 9, 9 a.m. in the morning. He begins to explain to them what's going on in verse 16. In Acts 2, 16, he says, But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I guess that's how you know if you're old or young, amen? When the Spirit's poured out on you. And my men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now Peter starts out by quoting Joel chapter 2 verses 28 and 32. My question is this. This is probably about as far as we're going to get this morning. But what are the last days? What are the last days? Let me tell you what the last days are. They started when Jesus came and they will end when He comes again. We in this room have lived our whole lives in the last days. We are living in the last days. Some might get cynical about that. You know, I've heard that. We're in the last days. We're in the last. Well, that's because all your life you've been in the last days. But we have to remember with the Lord, according to 2 Peter 3 8, with the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. You've got to understand, you know, we're so limited in our thinking. All we can think is in the realm of time. But God is outside of time. A thousand years is nothing. It's only been a couple of days in His kingdom, in His, in his mind, uh, since Jesus came and, and died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. I know, we, we can't hardly comprehend that. But that's why He is so much greater than we are. Amen? He's God. So even though we can't comprehend it, we need to trust Him. The last days again started when Jesus came and they will end when He comes again. Now, they believe they were in the last days. I believe we're in the last days. But we're not in the last of the last days. But we're getting closer all the time. Amen? So let's just take a look at a few brothers here and see what they had to say about it. First of all, Brother Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, listen to what he says about the last days. He says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of, or perilous times, or times of stress. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman. Do you see a little bit more of that every, every year? <laughs> then Brother Peter, in uh, 2 Peter 3, 3, says, Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions. You know, it's one thing for people to say something's all right, but don't change what the Bible says about it, amen? If you believe something's all right, you know, that, you know that's between you. But... Don't try to change what the Word of God says about different situations. Amen? Amen. 
Jesus, or actually they're scoffing with passion, saying, where is the promise of His coming? Then we see Jesus uh, uh, in Luke 21, 9 through 11, He said, when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for this must take place. You realize we're hearing more and more about wars than we've ever heard, at least in my lifetime. There's wars everywhere and the opportunity for wars just on the rise everywhere. It says, do not be terrified, for this must first take place, but the end will not be at once. In other words, you're going to you know, it says he comes as a thief in the night. Thank God, I believe we as believers, before the worst of the worst gets here, you know, we're going we're to get out of here. Some don't believe that. If you don't believe that, that's fine. I, I, I kind of go back to a guy I heard years and years ago that said, uh, uh, if uh, you, you want to believe in pre-trib, buy so-and-so's tape. And if you want to believe in post-trib, buy this person's tape. And, and if somebody says, I just believe in hand-trib, and it all pan out in the end. You know, I just say, uh, pray for pre-trib, prepare for post. Amen. But, uh, but I, I do believe that God has always taken His people out first before uh, judgment came. So anyway, uh, He goes on to say, uh, nation will rise against nation and kingdom will rise against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilence, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. The end of the end will be bleak in many ways. But there is an upside. You want to hear the upside? Listen to what Matthew says. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. That doesn't sound very up. And put you to death. And you'll be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. You see, we don't, in America, we don't really understand this very well. Now don't get me wrong, especially for our wonderful visitors today. We're, we're normally, uh, we talk in love and blessings of God and, and, and all, but, but every once in a while you've got to look at the whole picture, amen? And, uh, you know, we in America don't understand uh, uh, persecution. You know, somebody, you know, says something mean to us and we get our feelings hurt, well, I've been so persecuted. You know, there's places like Korea and China and, and, and different places, India, or not India, but over in the Middle East, uh, there's places, as you well know, with ISIS and the killing of Christians, and that you know you're you're putting your life in danger to speak the name of Jesus. And we don't really quite comprehend that. You know, we're talking about we may be facing these in the last of the last days. Well, they're facing it right now. But we we're so American-minded, we think it's all about us. We're not really hardly mentioned in the Bible, amen. But we're so Americanized that we think it's all about us. But there are people that are experiencing these things even today. He goes on to say, let me uplift you a little bit more. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because wickedness is multiplied. Now I think that's a, something to think about right there. Wickedness is multiplied. Not just added, but multiplied. You know how quick things multiply? But says wickedness multiply. Most men's love will grow cold. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Most men's love will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be. Here's, here's the good news. I have to get through all that and get to this. Here's the good news. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. Church, we need to get excited about the gospel being preached to all nations. All, you know, the gospel has gotten around a lot of the world, but there's still a lot of unreached people. And we need to get the word of God out to all nations, the gospel out to all nations, where everybody has an opportunity to receive Jesus. Amen? It says the love of many will grow cold because the wickedness is multiplied. Most men's love will grow cold. Their love for Jesus will grow cold. Listen, if you just have religion, you're not going to hang in there. The good news, this gospel will be preached throughout the whole world. Then the end will come. Now, here's my question. Who is it that's going to preach this gospel? 
is going to be those that we talked about last week, those that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Those that are filled with power to be witnesses unto Jesus. You see, the church will be on fire. Throughout history, persecution has always brought out the best in the church. It weeds out those that are playing church and those that are serious about following Jesus. Today in America, I don't know if I said this last week or just talking to Cheryl, but I said the church in America is a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, we're just, there's no depth to our relationship with Christ. But it says He's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. When He talks about all flesh, it's about those who call upon the name of the Lord and are saved. He's going to pour His Spirit out. Church, the closer we get to the last days, the more He's going to pour out His Spirit. It kind of goes where, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen? And as we get closer to that last day, the more He's going to pour His Spirit out. And the more manifestation of His power. Because we're going to need it. Yeah. I remember, if I'm not going to try to guess how long ago it was, but when I went to Mexico, I'll tell you, church, where we were at, there was such a demonic warfare going on that you felt the pack up the power of the Holy Spirit more than I ever felt it in my life. But I didn't realize it until we left that my life was in danger the whole time. We were there some of the places that we went into, the, the gangs, and, and uh, I mean, I was just on fire for God, just, you know, young, and, you know, not a worry in the world. And I started finding out later the places we went, you know, they'd kill you just as soon as look at you. And, uh, but you see, I had the, 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 the Holy Spirit was just resting on us. And, and we just felt that victory. And, uh, that's the way I believe we're going to see this when we start walking through those dark times. Or even as people in other countries already walk through dark times, the power of the Holy Spirit will just energize us and give us a boldness that does not come from within ourselves, but it comes from the Holy Spirit. The church will be on fire and it will generate a brilliant light for this dark world to be guided to Christ. And once we quit making it about Jesus Christ, once we quit making it about leading others to Him, we're making it about the wrong thing. You know, I, I thank God for His blessings. I thank God for the fellowship that we have. I thank God for the picnic we're going to have. I thank God for all these different things and praise God for them. I love fellowship. But church, if that's all we make it about, we're heading down the wrong road. Now, God wants us to have fellowship. God wants to bless us. God wants to heal us. God wants to deliver us. If you didn't know that's a plug for the men's, men's, men's Bible study. Uh, but God wants to do all these things. But at the same time, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is leading people to Christ. That's the main thing. It says, He's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. A mighty out. You know, church, I want to be red hot for Jesus. I want to be red hot. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to be on fire. That's my heart's desire. I want to be on fire, uncompromising, filled with the Holy Spirit. And not only that, but I want Crosswalk Fellowship to be right there with me. I don't want to, you know, when I first started pastoring, I, I said this. I don't know how many times. I don't want to be just another church on another corner. I want God to use us to make a difference. To make a major difference. And you know how you do that? One life at a time. Amen? One life at a time. You have this awesome message within you. You don't have to be a professional speaker or just go to your friend and Talk to them about your relationship with Christ and how they can have that same relationship. It doesn't take a theologian to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It just takes an experience. Amen? That you know Him. It's just like you know me and you can bring somebody into this church and say, here, I want you to meet Pastor Tony. 
If you can say, here, I want you to meet Jesus. Amen. Because you know Him. And you can take people. I remember when we were pastoring in Wisconsin. You know, it was, a, it was an awesome, fruitful time. I had youth. All the time, we would bring people and say, hey, this is Johnny. He wants to know Jesus. We had people getting saved during announcements. But the Holy Spirit was just resting on us during that particular time. Let it be your prayer that the Holy Spirit would rest on your life and our life as a local church. That people would just be drawn to Jesus. Amen? We need that. We need that. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. I want to, I want to call to just pray together. I want us to pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit to just move in our lives. Would you just begin right now in your own way? Just, just ask the Lord to touch you, to fill you, to overflowing with His Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your feeling, Lord. I just pray, God, that you would just touch us, that you would move through us, in us. Lord God, that we would just begin to see the power of your Holy Spirit moving among us, in a powerful way, ways that we've never seen before. Lord, use each and every one of us to be a light in this dark world. Lord, help us to remain bold, uncompromising uh, concerning Your Word. And Lord, let us stand up in love. Lord, let us stand up not as being judgmental or uh, uh, pointing fingers, but Lord, just pointing people to You. Father, You are freedom. And Lord, this world's looking for freedom. Some of them just don't know what they're looking for right now. But in their hearts, that's what they're looking for. And Father, I thank you that, that Jesus came to deliver us and to, to set us free. And Lord, I just give you the glory right now for reaching uh, out to those around us through us, God. We want to be all willing vessels, Lord, for you to work through. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, rest upon this place. Father, make Crosswalk Fellowship a habitation of your spirit, your presence, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. We magnify you, Lord. We, we exalt your name together this morning. You and you alone are worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.